Hello, welcome back to the sixth week of the Jerusalem Science Contest. This week we'll be examining chapters 15 and 16 in your textbook. Chapter 15 is agricultural entomology and chapter 16 is forestry. And today my lecture will be centered on chapter uh, 15, the agricultural entomology chapter. The title of the lecture is Insecticides, Mode of Action and Safety. If you th consider that the world's gross domestic product back in 2012, just two years ago, was $85 trillion, and it's been estimated that perhaps 3% of that amount was due to agriculture. That would come out to about $2.5 trillion that year. So I would assume that probably in 2013, where I don't have data for that yet, and this year, it's going to be somewhere in the same uh, amount, maybe even a little bit greater. Uh, we're dealing with a very large amount of money, and we're dealing with a significant uh, problem when we consider that perhaps a third of the destruction or the um, crop damage that we have annually comes from insects. We have a growing population in the world that's estimated to probably reach something over 9 billion people by the turn, not by the turn of the century, but by, by the middle of the 21st century. So by the year 2050, we'll have an excess of 9 billion people on this planet. And in order to feed that many people, you certainly cannot afford to lose uh, a great deal of your uh, agricultural product. So it's also estimated, and there, there's some controversy about this, about how much of the output, the world's output, would be lost if it were not for pesticides. And certainly uh, the estimates of at least 80, and in some cases as high as 90% of the agricultural output would be lost without the use of pesticides. Uh, even with pesticides, uh, we're still losing probably at least 10% of what we could be producing because of, um, of various kinds of pests. But it's very, very important then uh, that we have a, an insecticide market. And I wanted to say a little bit about the uh, insecticides, the kinds of insecticides that are in use today, uh, what, how, they, how they act, and uh, what, uh, what problems we might have terms of their uh, safety. So we're going to look first at one of the ways that we classify insecticides. And we couldn't classify, we could classify them as being systemic or contact insecticides. So that's one form of uh, classification. A systemic insecticide is going to be one that will be absorbed by the insect internally and it will disrupt some some particular enzyme system or will disrupt some system within the insect, killing the insect. A contact insecticide requires uh, that the insect, uh, the, the insecticide actually hit the insect. So a systemic insecticide might be something that you would directly spray on a plant. The insect will begin to eat the plant and as soon as it does, uh, the toxins will, will be absorbed in, in the insect's body and kill it. So the contact insecticide actually has to hit the insect. So you know this is something, if you've ever tried to uh, kill a fly with some kind of uh, a bug bomb or any other kind of insect, these are uh, contact insecticides. These are things where you actually have to hit the insect pretty much in order to be able to kill it. And then we could also uh, uh, classify uh, insecticides as either being naturally occurring insecticides or they could be synthetic insecticides. And if they're synthetic, uh, they might be organic or they might be uh, inorganic. And then I've also got in here uh, what we call, what I'm calling uh, plant incorporated uh, protectants. And these specific kinds of compounds um, would be things that would be transgenic. So anything that we could put inside, inside a plant uh, that could then cause the plant, uh, a genetic change uh, in the plant that would cause the plant to become resistant to a particular uh, insect species or a number of insect species.
because what we've done is we've inserted a gene that will actually now enable that plant to make, to biosynthesize um, whatever the toxin is that, we, that we, we would be using to kill the insect. So that would be an example of a plant incorporated uh, protectant. These things are uh, sometimes abbreviated, they're known as uh, PIPs. But these are, uh, as I said before, these are trans, transgenic pro uh, products. So these are some of the uh, kinds of classes, and, and this is not a, an all-inclusive uh, group of classes, of chemical classes of insecticides, but we have up here the, uh, or uh, the organochlorides, the organophosphates, the carbamates, the pyrethroids, the neonicotinoids, and the rhinoids, and I'll have something to say about all of these various kinds of uh, chemical classes momentarily. Now, here are some other things. Well, I already mentioned uh, the plant-incorporated protectants. Uh, we also have what are known as uh, insect growth regulators, and these may be either mold disruptors or what are known as ecdysones. And again, I'll have more to say about that as well. Uh, then there are um, biologicals. Uh, these are uh, principally bacterial insecticides, things like Bacillus uh, thuringiensis. Bacillus thuringiensis is something that you can purchase at any, uh, you could go to Home, Home Depot or probably any other uh, garden supply store and be able to get it. It's, a, it's in a powder form. It is a bacterium that is um, not pathogenic to human beings. However, uh, it will, it will uh, when insects eat this, when they get it inside their body, it produces a toxin uh, that will kill them. And uh, BT is the name that it's usually sold under. Bacillus thuringiensis is particularly toxic to Lepidopterous insects. These are things like moths and uh, butterflies. And it's the larval form of these insects, the caterpillars of these insects, that do uh, most of the uh, biological damage. And finally, uh, the uh, plant-derived materials are actually, there are some uh, plants that, that bio, biosynthesize their own insecticides. So those same materials can be extracted from those plants and then sprayed on other plants as a form of uh, protection. So this is, uh, and I certainly don't expect you to, to memorize this or to know all these things, but it's just showing you, I think I have something like 14 uh, different uh, types of, mo different modes of action that I'm showing here, and there actually are more than that. But if, we, if I could roughly classify these, the first uh, four or five up to here, up to chloride channel activators, all of these things are somehow going to, an, they're involved in inhibiting nerve transmission. So they're, they're basically um, uh, shutting the insect's uh, nervous system down. And then down here, uh, the mult disruptors, uh, the chitin, biosynthesis inhibitors, ecdysones, uh, those, these three uh, categories have to do with the insect's ability to grow, to molt, uh, to produce an exoskeleton. Uh, oxidative phosphorylation inhibitors and mitochondrial complex uh, electron transport inhibitors, uh, those kinds of compounds would be involved in uh, shutting down the production of ATP. So the, uh, the, the, this is occurring in the mitochondria and that means that the insects are not going to be able to uh, produce any ATP and therefore all the uh, mechanisms that require ATP uh, for energy production are going to be shut down as well. Uh, voltage dependent sodium channel blockers, actually that should have gone up here with sodium channel uh, modulators in terms of uh, mode of action, and finally uh, the lipid synthesis inhibitors. And there are a whole bunch of uh, different compounds that fall into these classes, some of which uh, I'll be talking about in a moment. So the one first thing I wanted to talk about are these compounds that are uh, chitin synthesis inhibitors. The, the first one that you see over here, this bis uh, trifluron is, um, if you notice right in here, and this is a colored area, this is a urea. Uh, we, this is actually a benzoyl urea, and we've seen these, this category of compounds before. 
There were some benzoyleureas that were herbicides, uh, but this particular one, bistrifluron, is a chitin synthesis inhibitor, which means that uh, the insect's exoskeleton is composed of, of chitin, and uh, if, if the insect is unable to make chitin, if it can't biosynthesize chitin, basically that's shutting down its ability uh, to, to, uh, to have a, a protective exoskeleton, and therefore it's going to be prone to injury, uh, to infection, there's all kinds of things that will happen to this insect, and it's it's it all ultimately is going to wind up killing the insect. Uh, here's another compound, uh, buprofazine, and these this compound is unlike the other one. This is a different uh, category of compound. This is a uh, called a thiodiazine uh, uh, insecticide, and this one here uh, looks a little bit like atro atrazine, which if you remember, atrazine was a uh, was also a herbicide, but this is a 135 or a symmetrical uh, triazine, a 135 triazine. And this compound, uh, cyromazine, is also a chitin synthesis inhibitor. So we've got certain uh, molecules that have more than one kind of activity. Uh, I suspect that this would probably also have some herbicidal activity, although I don't know that for a fact, but I think it would. Uh, here is a classic insecticide. This insecticide has been around for many, many, many years and it was used very, very successfully uh, to control things like mosquitoes and had been used in the United States and it was used worldwide. And then sometime in the, um, I guess it was in the early uh, 1960s perhaps, uh, there was a biologist by the name of Rachel Carson who wrote a book called Silent Spring. And uh, many people will say that it was her book that actually gave rise to the uh, environmental protection movement, uh, which then started to really blossom in the late 60s and the early 70s. But um, for many years, I used to think that Rachel Carson actually did more harm than good because uh, her work seemed to indicate that this compound was doing extensive damage to the environment. Um, she was finding things like uh, that when birds laid their eggs, the shells became very, very thin and frequently were damaged and this was killing birds and it also had deleterious effect on, uh, on mammals and, and uh, other creatures that were living in the environment. Not only was it killing insects, but it was killing other things as well. So uh, as a result of her book, uh, DDT was pretty much entirely eliminated in the United States. But it was the, the wholesale spraying of DDT was also eliminated in places like Africa, uh, where you had very, very poor populations, and you had a tremendous malaria problem. So what was controlling the mosquito that gave rise to, the, to malaria uh, was not necessarily effectively being treated. And because of that, I always felt that, uh, indirectly, that Rachel Carson was probably responsible for the deaths of millions of people. And you'll still read that, uh, that she was responsible for the deaths of millions of people in, in Africa and some other areas of the world because uh, they did not have alternative, inexpensive insecticides that they could use to control the uh, malaria problem. However, in her defense, I would now kind of reverse my position because my understanding is, and from, from some material that has come to my attention recently, that African countries still do use DDT. Uh, they, they're using it in a more responsible way, but they're still using it to control uh, mosquito populations. So I can't, I don't think we can really lay that on Rachel Carson. Uh, but nevertheless, this is a problematic molecule. These kinds of chlorinated hydrocarbons are very much like the types of materials that I think I may have mentioned uh, previously that were used for other kinds of things, things like uh, polychlorinated biphenyls, which were used as uh, electrical insulators. And these things got into the environment and caused uh, some, some problems. But these kinds of aromatic, uh, chlorinated aromatic hydrocarbons are, can be very, very persistent. They're broken down uh, very slowly in the environment and uh, because of that if you put DDT down on something it's still going to be there 
many, many years later. And there's some, I think they may be on the next slide here. Uh, other, uh, by the way, in, in terms of mode of action, DDT uh, is something that interferes um, with, uh, it opens uh, sodium channels and this causes a constant firing of neurons in, in the insect. Now these other things are what are known as ga uh, GABA gated, GABA is gamma amino butyric acid. So these are gamma amino butyric acid gated chloride channel antagonists. Again, what it's doing is you've got a movement of ions across uh, uh, the cell membranes and it's that movement of ions, the movement of sodium ions, the exchange of chloride ions, these things are giving rise to electrical potentials that uh, enable nerve transmission. So this again is one of the things that um, is involved in, um, in inhibiting because of these things being antagonists for, the, uh, for, for chloride channels. They're actually blocking uh, these uh, chloride channels and because of that, uh, these things also act to inhibit nerve transmission. Now, some of the earlier ones were aldrin and dieldrin, uh, named because of a chemical reaction called the Diels-Alder reaction. And the Diels-Alder reaction is the way that these compounds were made. So one of them was called aldrin, and the other one was called uh, dieldrin. And they just differ by the fact that um, this uh, aldrin, compared to dieldrin, has, a, uh, has an oxygen inserted uh, across this double bond. It forms this three-membered ring. Uh, that is called an oxyrane ring. And then there's another compound here, uh, which is similar to dieldrin. It's a different uh, isomer of dieldrin. Uh, the, the, uh, this group here is actually attached kind of in an upside down way, and this is called endrin. So these three compounds kind of together are very, very similar to one another, and they are extraordinarily persistent. They're no longer, I don't know that they're used anywhere in the world uh, at this point in time, but uh, their uh, production and uh, uh, use in the United States is not is is uh, forbidden. And then there's another compound here that also uh, was very popular. As a matter of fact, I used I used to work for the company that made this. Uh, it was a local company f uh, for a long period of time. I think they may still be in the Chicago area. It's a company called uh, Velsicol, and uh, Velsicol. Uh, produces this compound, or produced this compound, and it was a, uh, again, it was a, uh, a, uh, a compound that uh, was very, very effective in controlling uh, um, all kinds of insects, and particularly things that were, that were hard to control, uh, like carpenter ants, uh, which would get into houses, and they would cause a lot of damage, and I know I myself had uh, put chloridane down uh, uh, on the, uh, around the foundation of my house to control uh, carpenter ants. When it was no longer available, it became a real problem because there never really was a good um, uh, alternative to the use of that material. So it turns out that um, because of that, uh, there are, there, these things are much, much more difficult to control uh, nowadays. But chloridane uh, is a compound that if you put it down on the ground, uh, you can expect 75 years later that you're still going to find chloridane where you apply it because it's something that is extraordinarily uh, persistent. So the next category that I want to talk about is our uh, acetylcholine uh, esterase inhibitors. So uh, these ACH inhibitors, um, there are a couple different categories. One of them are organophosphates. So these compounds that all have structures that have either, uh, they're either, most of them are what we call thiophosphates or diphthiophosphates. So they have two sulfurs in here. This is the phos phosphate group. Um, some of them might be, uh, I don't think any of the ones that are, that are being, that I'm, none of the ones that I'm showing here are just phosphates. This is a thiophosphate, uh, diaz diazinon. Parathion is another one. Uh, uh, malathion has two sulfur has uh, uh, two sulfurs in it, and uh, some of them have even more. Ethion has four sulfur uh, atoms in it, but most of them have uh, double bonded sulfur to the phosphorus atom. And uh, these compounds all act by inhibiting uh, acetylcholine esterase, which is the enzyme that um, attacks acetylcholine or that transforms acetylcholine 
back into choline and acetate. So without that, what happens is you have a continuous uh, transmission of a nerve, rather than getting a nerve impulse, you have something that is transmitting continuously and that causes the nerve to be constantly firing and uh, that means that, that you, that that nerve basically becomes paralyzed. So uh, that's how these things kill, but unfortunately they're not, um, I think putting the sulfur on there, uh, rather than just having an oxygen with oxygen on here, these things would be much, much more toxic uh, to insects, but they would also be very, very toxic uh, to human beings. But there have been cases of people being poisoned by uh, parathion. I think malathion is supposed to be somewhat less toxic than that, but I know people have died uh, from, uh, from using parathion, uh, you know, getting too much of it on themselves when they were spraying it. Uh, there, so there have been some deaths worldwide from the use of that material. So these kinds of compounds, uh, while they're pretty good insecticides, uh, they're also uh, pretty dangerous. Uh, the next class of uh, choline inhibitors uh, are known as carbamates. And the, what, what, makes a, what makes a carbamate is uh, this particular group here. It's a methyl, it's a CH3, NH, C double bond, O, O. Um, so all of these things are actually what we call carbamyl oxymes. So the carbon double bonded to the nitrogen with the oxygen on it is uh, that, uh, having an OH here, that would be an oxime. And then we carbamylated that, so it's a carbamyl oxime. So these compounds, carbofuran, uh, aldicarb, carbaryl, uh, this one, um, thiophanox, was produced by another company uh, that I work for, a company called, uh, uh, called uh, I mentioned Velsicol before, but this one uh, was made by Diamond Shamrock, which was another agricultural uh, chemical company that I work for. And the compounds that you see up here, bethamyl, these are two uh, structural isomers of the same compound. They just differ by the uh, placement of the CH3S, the methyl thio group and the methyl group, here they're inverted. And you actually have that in all of these compounds. Um, I'm only showing one of the two isomers, but any one of them would probably be, be a mixture of the what we call the Z and E isomers, depending on uh, which side of the double bond uh, these groups happen to be. And here's another one that was, uh, it doesn't have a name. I think it may have had a name, but I don't remember what it is anymore. Uh, this was a compound that was produced uh, shortly before I started working for Diamond Shamrock. It came uh, from the same group uh, that had developed uh, thiophanox, and they were looking for other sulfur-containing uh, compounds that would have a novel structure. It's again, it's a carbamyl uh, oxime, and uh, that particular molecule was of great interest. And I probably worked on um, analogs of this, that is structurally uh, related compounds, for uh, maybe two years of my career. I was involved in synthesizing and uh, working on these kinds of compounds. So I know a little bit about the chemistry of these things. Uh, on the next slide, these are similar to the compounds that I showed you, that one compound that I showed you on the previous slide, which the only difference was that instead of there being two carbons here, there was one carbon. So we started to investigate these, these compounds. They were a little bit, um, they had uh, a little bit better stability and they were easier for us to prepare. And the first one that was made uh, was this compound here and had very good insecticidal activity. And by the way, the carbamates, even though they are um, inhibitors of choline esterase, and that inhibits not only choline esterase in, um, in um, insects, but it would also inhibit choline esterase in, in mammals. Uh, these things tend to be much less toxic to uh, mammals than they are to uh, insects. However, the insects kind of, after a while, they started to develop the ability to metabolize these things by oxidizing this sulfur atom, which seemed to potentiate the activity of, of these compounds. They oxidized this uh, sulfur from a sulfide to a sulfoxide. So this is an SO group here. And then finally, they would convert this to a sulfone. And the sulfones were pretty much entirely inactive. So these things wouldn't function as insecticides anymore. So around this time, I uh, suggested 
to uh, individuals who are working in this area that we might want to look at um, replacing the sulfur atom here with an oxygen atom, um, which you see in this compound down here. And I worked for uh, at least six months attempting uh, to make this compound. Initially, I was told that the root that I wanted, the uh, chemical root that I wanted, would not work. And um, it was, uh, I, I didn't, because of that, I really didn't do any work on this at all for about three months. And then uh, within that, that three month period, someone published a paper that indicated that the root that I was suggesting was actually a viable route for making compounds that had this ring structure, but I still had to do other chemistry in order to be able to put this group on here. And you couldn't do it the same way you did with a sulfur compound. So it was a little bit more involved. And it took about six months uh, for me to ultimately make uh, both this compound and another compound that had a, a double bond here. And these compounds were quite active and they had a different um, spectrum of activity uh, compared to the sulfur analogs, the corresponding sulfur compounds. Plus they had the added advantage that there is no way that the insect could oxidatively uh, metabolize this and inactivate it. So these compounds were, were very, very good compounds. Um, unfortunately, Diamond Shamrock um, decided to get out of the agricultural chemi chemical business just when things were getting really, really interesting with these compounds. So I don't know what ever became of them. I uh, left the company about six months before uh, they got out of the business because I could see the handwriting on the wall. Another uh, thing that you can also do, uh, and this was something that, that, that I, I worked on and other uh, people at Diamond Shamrock were also working on this, but it wasn't just our company. Other people uh, were doing this as well. It had been found that if you um, took the NH group from a carbamate and you sulfenylated it, you put something with a sulfur, and it didn't have to be, uh, here I'm showing a, a, a phenyl, a thio group, uh, you know, a, a benzene ring and a sulfur, but there were a whole bunch of different things that you could put on. I could have just used R here to represent um, the, the group that we're putting on here. And if you put those kinds of groups, uh, this is the same compound. This is the compound that I showed in the last slide that we had made, thiophanox, and we made a number of these kinds of derivatives. And what's interesting about this is that when you put this, uh, when you apply this, and spray it and it gets on an insect or if it gets on an animal, it's metabolized in different ways by the insect and by uh, the, uh, the animal, if the animal happens to be a mammal. So if, if you're looking at an insect, what the insect will do is enzymatically, it will cleave the bond between the sulfur and the nitrogen atom. So what that does is, uh, is it, it just regenerates thiophanox, it regenerates the original insecticide. However, uh, when you put this in, and, and, and it kills the insect, but when you put it into mammals, instead of breaking the bond right here, instead of breaking the bond here, it's actually breaking the bond over here. What that does is it causes the, um, this thing to come off as an SNH, as an SN methyl, and then there's a hydrogen here, and over here we've got a carboxylic acid. We actually have a carbonate, but it loses carbon dioxide and it ultimately goes to something that is a double bond NOH, which winds up hydrolyzing and giving you um, uh, just a ketone here. And this material right here is not biologically active. It's not. It's not toxic. So, uh, at least not in the uh, in, in, in these in the in the same kinds of concentrations. So uh, this is a form of what we call safening, and these things were referred to as safening agents. And this is a way to take something that's uh, fairly toxic and dangerous and apply it so that it, uh, it's much less toxic. Uh, here's another class of compounds. Uh, these are actually, uh, some of these are naturally occurring materials. Uh, pyrethrin 1 and 2 is, is actually a natural product. And I think these things were originally, if, I, if memory serves me correctly, I think they may have originally been extracted from chrysanthemums. And I think the chrysanthemum if, I, if, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, uh, was, was a plant that was pretty uh, insect resistant because it was producing uh, pyrethrins. Anyway, uh, these are two synthetic ones, allethrin and permethrin. And these uh, 
insecticides are very good because they have a rapid, uh, what is known as knockdown. So when you spray this on an insect, the insect, if you were to spray this on a flying insect, as soon as it hits the insect, the insect's going to fall to the ground. So uh, unlike some of these other uh, uh, the systemic uh, materials that take uh, quite a bit of time uh, before they actually kill the insect, or the insect has to kind of chew them up before anything is going to happen to them. This is, uh, these things are also, uh, these are uh, uh, voltage-gated sodium channel uh, 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 blockers. So they close the voltage-gated sodium uh, channels and uh, this um, in, in insect axons and that causes uh, paralysis of the insect, which is why an insect that is flying is suddenly going to fall to the ground because it, can't, it can no longer beat its wings. Again, these are kind of interesting because they're natural products, but they have this unusual, uh, we don't see this very much, a cyclopropane ring, this three-membered ring uh, here, and that's characteristic of the uh, pyrethroids. Uh, this next compound, or compounds like this, are known as uh, rhinoids, and this particular one is a calcium, all of them have the same mode of action. They're all calcium channel blockers, and again, uh, these things are going to inhibit, um, because of that, they're going to inhibit electrical impulses. And this compound is somewhat, um, the structure of it is somewhat reminiscent of a steroid. Uh, there would be a six-membered ring here, and there'd be another ring out here, but you'd have a six, you'd have a six-membered, a six-membered, a six-membered up here, and then where you have a five-membered ring here, you'd have a five-membered ring up here, but it's somewhat similar to that. But uh, ryanodyne, um, I think, may be a natural product as well. Uh, Imidacloprid is the neonicotinoid, and this is actually the naturally occurring compound, nicotine. And you can see that they are uh, pretty closely related to one another. Now, nicotine has been known to be uh, an insecticide for a very, very long period of time. As a matter of fact, I don't know whether it's still being used, but for a long time it was used in the form, I think, of its sulfate. It was be converted to the sulfate, and that was used as a sheep and cattle dip. So uh, sheep and cattle would actually be um, dipped. They would actually walk through, I guess, a bath that had a, a, a low concentration of, um, of this particular uh, uh, compound, the, the, the nicotine, as the sulfate or maybe as the chloride and that would kill whatever insects happen to be on their, uh, on their wool. As I said, this is extremely uh, toxic, and it's also very, very toxic uh, to mammals as well. And the neonicotinoids, uh, uh, what they do is they bind uh, at the postsynaptic neonicotinic uh, acetylcholine uh, uh, receptor, and what that does is, again, uh, because it's, it, although it's not a cholinesterase inhibitor, it's binding at the receptor, at the ACH uh, receptor, and um, it's basically a central nervous system poison then. Again, it's going to be something that is going to uh, kill um, insects because it's going to paralyze them. If they, will un they will undergo uh, nerve paralysis. And Again, these compounds, nicotine, while it's quite toxic to human beings, some of these synthetic ones, the so-called neo or new nicotinoids, the neonicotinoids like imidacloprid, uh, this particular compound, although it's quite toxic to insects, it has very, very low uh, mammalian uh, toxicity. So it can be, uh, we don't have to worry so much about that causing uh, problems to animals, to other animals, I should say. And here's another one of these um, compounds. This is a big one. This is a uh, macrolid. So if you look at this uh, ring here, this is actually one continuous ring. It goes from here, it goes from here, through here, 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 and you've got, I didn't count all the atoms in here, but uh, these kinds of things are called macrolids. It's probably, well, let's see, if I start here, I've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, so it is a, it, it's a, a 16 membered uh, macrolid. It's a 16 membered ring that forms that compound, uh, avermectin. And there's these, uh, both of these I believe are naturally occurring, avermectin uh, B1A, which has uh, where the R group is up here, 
They differ just by, uh, this one has an ethyl group, a CH2, CH3, and B1B has a methyl group, a CH3 group. Uh, these things are chloride channel activators. Again, they're gonna be causing continuous uh, firing of neurons, and uh, they're gonna be uh, quite toxic to insects. Uh, this one here is uh, uh, called Pestinal. I misspelled that. I think there's only there should only be one L in there, not two L's. Uh, but Pestinal is uh, diphenthyuron is the uh, is the generic name for that compound, and that is a diphenyl ether. And this makes it a diphenyl ether. And we've seen those kinds of compounds also in the uh, herbicide arena. But this one is an oxidative phosphorylation inhibitor which means that this is going to act as a mitochondrial poison. It's gonna be something uh, that will inhibit uh, oxidative phosphorylation, namely the production of uh, ATP, and that means that uh, the, the insects are not gonna be able to uh, have, uh, be able to biosynthesize ATP, uh, therefore they won't have the energy, uh, the high energy molecules necessary uh, to carry out um, um, life processes, and that again winds up killing them. I mentioned before that there were a, ca uh, a group of um, molecules uh, that are involved in uh, preventing uh, the insect's growth, and in this particular case, this uh, cyromazine, so this was one that I said resembled uh, atrazine on a previous slide, but it's actually, what it's doing is it's preventing uh, the insect from being able to molt. And the molt, of course, is to be able to uh, break out of its uh, chitinous exoskeleton uh, and then to, uh, to uh, continue to be able to grow. So that is a, a, a molt disruptor. And there's some other ones that are also uh, have a, a different mode of action. But these are uh, some naturally occurring compounds that are referred to as juvenile hormones. And these have an epoxide ring, this three-membered ring here, with an oxygen. We saw uh, droids, we saw a three-membered ring as well, but that one had three carbons. This one has an oxygen. So this is a this is called a uh, an oxide ring, this oxide ring ring here. And these juvenile hormones that also have uh, this long chain, uh, uh, long carbon chain with uh, two double bonds in it, categories of insects uh, that uh, some of, some of which when they develop. Uh, they are said to be uh, a metabolists, that is, uh, eggs are laid, and then they produce immature forms that just look like smaller uh, versions of the adult organism. So they basically grow up uh, in, uh, there's no really uh, metamorphosis that's, that's actually occurring. Then there's another type, uh, of sort of an intermediate form, that's called poro-metabolists, or gradual uh, metamorphosis. And here the hatchlings come out uh, in a form that's called a nymph, which generally resem resembles, it looks kind of like a wingless version of uh, the adult uh, uh, um, insect of, of that species. And it's nymphs uh, that grow by molding and uh, shedding their, uh, their, uh, their, their exoskeleton, and they form, each time uh, they form a new instar. Uh, or a new uh, uh, a growth phase. So the word uh, for the growth phase is it's called an instar, I-N-S-T-A-R. So there's, a, there's a, a third one which is known as homo metabolis or complete metamorphosis. And that's the third type of growth. And both the poro, P-A-U-R-O, N-E-T-A-B-O-L-O-U-S, poro metabolis, and the HOLO, H-O-L-O-M-E-T-A-B-O-L-O-U-S uh, metamorphosis involve um, these instar forms. Uh, the difference between the uh, poro metabolis, the one that I just described, and the HOLO metabolis, or complete uh, metamorphosis, is that uh, when the eggs are laid in a HOLO metabolis form, uh, the uh, eggs uh, hatch on whatever the, um, they're laid on a food source, and as soon as the uh, larvae uh, uh, hatch from the egg, they start eating, uh, and then they begin, uh, they immediately start eating, and their size is rapidly increased, and they will actually undergo a series of these uh, molts 
these uh, instar uh, uh, molts. So the larval form looks very much different from the adult form, unlike the uh, boromatabolus, where it's just, um, it, it looks, in that case, the larvae look like the adult, but in this form, uh, they don't. They, uh, the larvae look very different than the adult. So you can see this, uh, this kind of thing, for instance, in butterflies. If you look at the uh, larval forms of uh, butterflies, uh, which are sometimes called worms, but of course they're not really worms, they're just insect larvae, and these are the forms that are eating. They don't look at all like the adult uh, butterfly. But again, uh, they have to undergo a series of, uh, of molts. So uh, it's when you, what, what these naturally occurring hormones are doing is they're preventing the insect from maturing. That's why they're called juvenile hormones. They're actually preventing the molt because the insect needs to grow to a particular size before it molts. So without the presence of these hormones, uh, the insect might molt uh, too early, and if that happens, it would, it would lead to the insect's demise. So we can also make uh, synthesized juvenile hormones or juvenile uh, hormone, there are juvenile hormone analogs that could be made, or the juvenile hormones themselves could be applied uh, at, which would kill the insects if they were applied at the wrong time. Now, ecdysone, which is a naturally occurring uh, these are sometimes called ectisterols uh, because again, this is a steroidal type of material. Here, here you can see what we, what we saw in the other kinds of steroids that we looked at before. You've got the two six-member rings, this third six-member ring, and the five-member ring with the side chain on it. And ectisone is, um, is what actually causes the insect to begin the molding process. So uh, an ectisone agonist would be something that would cause that would that would cause uh, the insect uh, to start molding, and uh, the juvenile hormone is what prevents it from molding. So those those two uh, hormones in conjunction with one another, when the juvenile hormone level, uh, when it's time for the insect to molt, the juvenile hormone is no longer being produced, and then the ecdysones start to be produced. And when you don't want molding. Uh, then basically the ecdysone levels become very low and the juvenile hormones become uh, high. So uh, this particular material, halophenazide, uh, which is a hydrazine, um, it's a benzoyl hydrazine, uh, that compound is an ecdysone agonist. So it, that means that it's going to work as if it were ecdysone. It's something that's going to behave like ecdysone and it's go going to cause uh, the insect to molt. If it molts at the wrong time, again, that will kill the insect. So uh, that's how that um, agent happens to work. The things that I didn't mention, uh, some of the uh, inorganics, some of them are uh, things like sulfur, which has been around for ages, and sprinkling that on insects. I think uh, the mode of action there is just that there are um, uh, spiracles, uh, parts, of the, uh, parts of the insect where the insect is actually uh, taking in air, it's respiring, and the sulfur particles get in there and they block, uh, they block these pores, and that pr that basically causes the insect to suffocate. So there are a number of thing, number of other uh, kinds of, uh, of materials that are out there, but I just wanted you to get a flavor of the uh, different kinds of uh, ways that people uh, are trying to eliminate uh, uh, hazardous insects, ba insects that are bad uh, for our crops. But at the same time, we have to be careful because insects that are beneficial insects, insects like bees, for instance, uh, we want to have some kind of selectivity so we don't wind up wiping them out while we're wiping out uh, the, uh, the, the um, economically bad insects. Again, thank you for your uh, attention. And the exam will be on chapters, uh, I think I said 15 and 16. It's the in, uh, insect chapter and the forest, forestry chapter.